eQuez. Your quest for education starts here. Welcome to eQuez Audio. Hello, everybody. This is Margaret Feldman, founder of eQuez, a platform that helps students discover careers, find best fit schools, and make smart choices about higher education. This is episode 12 of Inside with Equez, where we take an inside look at the journeys and lives of students and professionals who are studying to enter or work in a particular career. Today we are speaking with Master Electrician Donald Metcalf. I'm super excited. This is our first electrician feature on our podcast. After listening to this episode, if becoming an electrician sounds interesting to you, visit equez.com. That's E-Q-U-E-Z dot com to schedule your personal career consultation. During your call, you will be able to talk to a professional in the field, learn about the state requirements, and understand the different training options that are available in your particular area. Donnie has been in the electrical construction industry since 1992. He started out as a helper remodeling restaurants in California. He worked his way up the ladder from helper to apprentice to journeyman to leadman to foreman to general foreman and finally to the office, managing different phases of electrical construction. Currently, he works as part of the project management team at an electrical contractor in the Waco, Texas area where he oversees the prefab department. When he's not at work, Donnie enjoys teaching and is currently teaching a first year accelerated class in Waco, Texas. Donnie is married to his high school sweetheart. They have four kids, two of whom are electricians. Donnie and his family currently reside in the Waco, Texas area. Now, let's hear from Donnie Metcalf. I want to start by saying, Donnie, thank you for joining us on this podcast. We're really excited to have you to kick off our electrical series. Well, I'm super excited to be here, super excited. Always willing to give back to the trade. This is a spot we can do it, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty humbled and honored. It's cool. Well, let's get started here. So I want to just dive right in head first. How did you first learn about the electrical trade and how did you get interested? Uh, well, it was just by happenstance, really a, a family friend just called, called me up one day and said, Hey, you know, I, at the time I had signed up to go to uh, some kind of college somewhere like Wyoming tech, something I can't even honestly remember. And he said, I know you're leaving in, in a few weeks. Why don't you come to work for me? make some money before you leave and about two days into it that was that was it i just decided man this is this is exactly where i want to be i'm not going to go to school this this is it so yeah i dropped drop school just like that and took off wow that's crazy so you literally had plans to go to school and then you tried this out just as kind of a you know job before college and then you ended up completely switching and going all out in the electrical trade True, true story. True story. Just like I, about two days into it, I just figured this is this is it. This is the greatest thing ever. So. And when you were doing that, did you ever think about considering other types of trades, or you just kind of had that experience? You liked what you were doing, and kind of went with it. Uh, well, to be honest, us electricians have to do a little bit of everything. Primarily, we focus we do focus on the electrical trade, but. You know, like if you if you're cutting something, uh, a device or something into the wall, and, and you you know you ding up the paint, you may be required to paint it or touch up the drywall a little bit. Uh, we may weld brackets to hold electrical equipment, so there could be some metal working or welding in there, th- things of that nature. So we we really do a little bit of everything, but I just uh, it, it just seemed the, the the best fit for me. You know, you get to think a little bit, you get to work hard, you get to do stuff on the rough side, the finishing side. So it was just good all the way around. Got it. And is there a particular area that you focus on? Are you uh, residential, industrial, commercial? What sort of specific type of work do you do? Um, well, mostly live in the commercial world. We will do do industrial, some light industrial. And residential is normally if somebody, you know, asks me if, if I can you know, hey, would you mind coming to my house and helping me with X or something like that? I really never got into the too much of the residential end other than just helping helping folks out. Okay. And can you give students just kind of a quick rundown about the differences between the different type of work that you could potentially go into? Like, what's the difference between residential, industrial, or commercial work? Uh, residential is is 
really the entry level of electrical work because um, there isn't too many different like cable types that, that you'd be exposed to. So, so it's more of an entry level thing. Things are smaller. The Obviously the job sites aren't as big. It's as big as the house is. So you, you can get there and you kind of learn the, 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 the simple things by repetition. Getting into the commercial, that, that's where I'm going to say that the bulk of the electrical work is because that's really what drives everything. We're talking from laundromats to gas stations to restaurants to big box stores, you know, uh, Best Buy, places like that. So that's really where, honestly, the bulk of the work is going to be. You get into industrial, that's, again, a little more specialized. So you're talking like refineries, big plants. So it's it's a lot more specialized work. And do you think that there are any misconceptions out there about what electricians do? One of the one of the big ones, probably, I don't know. I guess it's an irritant the most is that uh, to me, it's not not so, not so much as it used to be, but the stereotypical they look down on us. You know, we're just knuckle dragging construction workers. Uh, you know, that, that couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, it, it, it requires, especially in the electrical tra- trade, it requires a, you to have a pretty good head on your shoulders to be pretty smart with what you're doing. So we're not just, just dumb construction workers out, you know, d- just doing dumb things. I mean, it. Th- that's probably the biggest one, you know, is that it's like the spokes in a wheel. Everything, every bit of everything is needed. You know, we need doctors, we need lawyers, uh, but we need construction workers too because, you know, it, your, your electricity is going to go down in your house. You need someone to fix it. Right. You know, you, you need someone to paint your house. So, I mean, it's it's all kind of a give and take. And everybody, everybody's really needed, regardless of what it is. You just need to find your niche and find out what that niche is. Exactly. I, I so, so agree with that. And can you walk us through what your typical day looks like? Absolutely. You want you want my personal day, or you want like a day as an electrician? Because I, I kind of I live in a little a little different world than most. Sure, give us both if you don't mind. Sure, sure. You know, a, a, a normal let's just start off. A normal electrician, you know, is going to probably get up, get out of bed reasonably early, get to the job site by seven o'clock. You're going to get with your foreman. They're going to tell you what the task needs to be done during the course of the day. You know, see my my buddy in the background there, yeah. my knucklehead. Um, they're going to tell you what you, they expect you to do for the day, be it, you know, running conduit or pulling wire into something or hanging light fixtures or wh- whatever that action is that you're going to be taking during the day. You're going to, you're going to do that, do that work. You may be by yourself. Sometimes it's, it's solo work. It doesn't require two people. Sometimes it requires two or more people. And, and it's just an honest day's living. You're going to go out and you're going to do your task at the end of the day. You're going to clean up the mess that you're made. You're going to go home, hang out with your family and friends and, and wake up the next day and do it again. It's super, super awesome. Now, now I've I've been in the trade long enough uh, to where I don't really work too much with my tools and my hands anymore. I more develop action plans and 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 ways to do things. Um, all more on the paper end as far as getting submittals and things, uh, managing projects. Okay. And how many years have you been in the industry? Uh, since '92, so that makes what 28 years. Yeah, 28 years. I, I tell you what, I could I could not be happier. I, I could not be happier with it. That's great. And what can students look forward to as they progress? What options are if they want to move up and do more? Uh, well, you know, just just like I did, I started off as just just a, just an apprentice. I mean, literally, first tool I had in my hand was a shovel, okay. and I worked myself up to like I said now to where I'm more on the the project managing end of it. So students. Students getting into the trade, it, the, the great part of it is getting into the trade itself from a trade level, not necessarily ending up on a manager, or not starting off on a managerial level, but starting off on the entry level out in the dirt gives you much more, in my opinion, the ability to learn and realize what's right and wrong sure. when you do get to the managerial end because you've been in the field, you've seen it, you've done it, you've touched it, and it's like, okay, that okay, that's not going to work because, I mean, there's no way that that would work on the field having you been there. So I, I do think it's beneficial for you to climb the ladder but but start off the bottom and not necessarily skip any rungs but take those individual steps all the way up. Okay, got it. That makes a, a lot of sense. And from a travel perspective, kind of back when you were in it, how much did you travel? Were you required to travel? Uh, prob- good, good Lord. Prob- the first... 
I'd say that probably the first 15 years of my career, probably the first 15 years, I bet you I was gone probably 10 of those years. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, and it may have been short, you know, some of them a couple of weeks, weekend, uh, week long, some of them were six, nine months. But man, I got to see some cool stuff. I got to go to some cool places, do some cool, meet great people. You know, I mean, I got to one of the things I got to go to Philadelphia and do some work. So I got to see the Liberty Bell, you know, I mean, and that's something that, you know, I may not have ever got to do, you know, yeah. so it's just pretty, pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool little, little benefit to, to going out there and doing it. Absolutely. And is the travel a choice? Like, are they asking you, do you want to, or is it something where you're required to, or does it just depend on your particular contractor or employer? It, it does depend on the contractor, but for the most part, they're, they're going to, they're going to talk to you about it. They're not going to expect you to leave your family or friends or your house or something and, and go away for, you know, who knows how long. I mean, again, on, on a weekend or something, Hey, we got a project, you know, that's like three hours away. It's not really feasible to commute. But maybe it's only a three-day project. That, that's that's not so bad because they'll put you up in a hotel room for a few days and, and you go out and do your thing and then come home. But th they'll normally talk to you if, if you're going to be gone long term, and because it's got to be an agreement on on both parties that they're they typically tend to pay you a little bit more when you're out on the road like that. You do get some expenses comp. So in order for you for them to be comfortable with you going, they have to know that you're comfortable with it. Right. right. And just from like a commute standpoint in the day-to-day -day when you're not traveling, what does your what is your commute usually like? And are you kind of going to different projects each time or, or how does that work? Well, again, that, that really depends on your contractor and the venue that you live in. I live in Waco, Texas, so it's reasonably pr pretty small. It's not very big, it's small. So my commute in anywhere, I can, boy, I can almost get to anywhere in an hour. I mean, I can get all the way up to Dallas or Austin within two hours, but, uh, uh, it kind of depends on your venue, but you'll generally stay about, about an hour within the house range is, is a is a pretty good pretty good start. Got it. And how long are the projects usually? Uh, they can totally vary. That that can that's that's all over the board. I mean, there's projects of service calls that are a couple hours, and then there's projects that that are multiple years. Uh, you know, you get on some of the big prisons or big hospitals that you're building. I mean, those, those things can last a couple of years. And and that's cool, especially if you can start on it on early and being from the underground where you're, you're kind of start digging and then be one of the last ones there to finish up. It's pretty cool to see it actually get built and come along with it from nothing to something. It's pretty fascinating. Oh, yeah. I bet that's really rewarding part of it. It, 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 it is. And that that's probably one of the things that's kept me here in the trades is just that it's it's exciting to know that when i had my hands in that i did something be it uh, i don't know just a, a retail store or a hospital you know I'm, I'm helping build something that's taking care of people and and maybe someone that's hurt or or super sick you know i've, I've done something to kind of help them along it is super rewarding that's great and what would you say is your favorite part of the job and then also your least favorite part of the job uh, as an electrician, I always liked anything to do with production. So I mean, if it was if it was production, that was me. I mean, I like to just you know smoke and blood and sweat flying everywhere, and you're getting a ton of stuff done. I mean, that was that was where I lived, and I loved doing it. I suppose the least my least favorite part was probably finishing, um, the, just you know hanging fixtures and and trimming out devices that. And not that it's not necessary, because it certainly is. I have an end product, but again, I like the production. I just like the big, bad, you know, just the, the stuff that, that makes you hurt at the end of the day. That was the stuff that I loved. Okay, cool. And is there any specific piece of advice that you would give to students that are just entering the trade? Absolutely. A couple pieces of advice. One would be just, just do it. I mean, there's a lot of, there used to be a lot of stigma, and I think we're finally starting to right the ship to get it to come back up right to where it's it is okay to to be a blue collar and and build cool stuff with your hands it's okay and so don't obviously think about it but but don't overthink it just 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 do it and give it a chance you, you never know when you, when you might what, what you might find out there right. the other advice would just be to, to to pay attention you know pay attention and listen to the guys that are that are over you because they've been doing it for a while and they know they've been there. They've been in your exact shoes 
and they're trying to teach you something. So, so listen to what they say. And then probably lastly, I would say, do not be afraid to give back because I, I honestly feel that us, not just as electricians, but as any, any trade really, that we owe it to, the, to our particular trade to give back and teach those that are coming up how to do what we do. I mean, I, I didn't roll out of the womb knowing how to be an electrician. I had to be taught and I had some great teachers and great instructors and great journeymen that kind of took me by the hand and showed me things along my whole career. So I feel it's my right and my responsibility to, to give that back and, and, and do. Sure, that makes sense. And we've got to train the next you know, group of electricians that are- Absolutely. Do just as good of a job as, as you did. What has been your most memorable or rewarding experience working as an electrician? Hmm. Um, I, I know that, uh, and I probably wouldn't condone this, but <laughs> I know that uh, one of the coolest things was uh, I built uh, two 27-story high-rise towers in downtown San Diego, and I can remember sitting on the upper parapet up on the roof, sitting straddling the upper parapet wall with one leg hanging over 27 stories down, and just just sitting up there looking around, going, "Boy, this is a pretty this is a pretty cool view." <laughs> I mean, it's pretty cool, yeah. you know. And that's not something that you get to do. The normal person would get to do every single day, you know. And and here I am, I'm getting paid to do it. It's like, man, this is this is pretty this is pretty cool. It's pretty neat. It's really cool. I mean, I can't imagine that view that you had. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's got to be really cool. Yeah, it's it, it it was super super neat. Again, something that you don't you don't get to be down in the bowels of a building every day or up on the roof of a of a high rise building every day. So when you do, it's like wow, this is not something everybody gets to see. Pretty neat. Right. And I know you kind of touched on this before, but I wanted to sort of ask this question on its own. Uh, why do you think that your work as an electrician is important? Because I really want students to know kind of the why behind this career. Um, well, let me preempt it with saying that, okay, I'm biased a little bit, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to say that we're, we're the best trade around, but yeah. nothing, especially this day and age, nothing really works without electricity, and you're, you're always going to need it from a home to shopping centers to even the stuff that makes and manufactures the goods that we use require electricity to go, to go around. Right. A building is just a building without power, it's just a box. Unless you can have lights and air conditioning and stuff to plug your computers and whatnot into, right. it's just a box. So I, I think being an electrician is, is just super important and, and it's more than just an electrician general. I mean, you've got, you've got so much, you know, linemen and high voltage uh, that, that bring the stuff on the, the, to us on the, the overhead transmission lines to the low voltage technicians that, that do your phones and, and do your integration stuff and your automation. So it runs the whole gambit between everything. It, it, it's just super cool. And, and it's never gonna go away. It's, it's always gonna be here. Right. And what would you say, Donnie, overall is the current state of the electrical industry? Uh, right now we're, we're pretty good shape. What we are seeing a huge lack of is skilled tradesmen and women. I think some studies have shown, and, and it's my personal belief that, you know, I graduated school in, see what, 91. So back then it was still pretty beat into our heads pretty much that you need to go to college. You need to go to college, everybody go to college. Yeah. And a lot of folks my age listened and abided by that. So we're starting to see a huge gap in there between the younger kids nowadays starting to, to get into it and realizing and guys and gals my age and older who are starting to retire, we've got a big blank spot in the middle, big blank spot. Yep. And, and we're not filling it fast enough to where people are, are retiring or moving on to something else or passing away or whatever the case may be. We're not filling that void fast enough. So while the electrical industry is in, in pretty good shape and we're doing okay, we, we, are, we are suffering a little bit of, of lack of skilled trades. That kind of leads to my next question. So the demand for electricians currently is high. So yes. For students going into this, there is a certain level of job security. Would, would you agree with that? Um, I, I would, with, with the exception of, I mean, if, if you're not, 
And I, I think reading your questions that you'd uh, sent over to me earlier, if you're not willing to give it 110% going into it, just don't. I mean, just 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 don't give it your all. Yep. Other than that, yeah, if if you're willing to give it your all, yeah, the chances of you having having a job are are, are really good. There, it's just a, a ton of work, and we can't find people fast enough, long enough. Uh, I mean, it's just that there's tons of work. So it's good times right now to be in the construction trade. It's good. It's good time. And how is obviously? I'm sure it's different for every contractor, but. How is compensation typically structured? Are people paid by the hour? Are they salaried? What's sort of typical for the industry? Um, pretty typical for the industry. Your your field construction crews, so we're talking everything from helper all the way up to foreman. They're generally hourly. Uh, hourly employees, most companies pay you weekly. Okay. You start to get out of the blue collar end of it and into the, like the, white collar end of construction like in, into your managing positions that's typically where your salary comes in okay got it. so but, but but you can usually you can usually expect to be to be paid hourly got it and for students that are just starting as apprentices what wage scale do they typically see and then how, what jump do they get when they bump up to that journeyman license? Uh, it's going to depend on your venue but I can tell you that a green apprentice entering here in in my venue in the Waco area can generally expect to to receive probably twelve dollars an hour to start to just just getting into the trade, and by the time they finish their four year apprenticeship and move on to the journey level, we're terming out journeymen probably twenty five twenty six bucks an hour. So you can see almost a a double increase of your wages within about a four year time span. So it, it's really really good. Got it, and. For students that are just starting off as apprentices, do they start earning that wage right away? Yes, ma'am. Day day one, and that's the beauty. That is the beauty of an apprenticeship. Is an apprenticeship is typically an earn while you learn kind of thing. So you're getting paid to learn the trade while you're actually doing it. So I mean, you're cash positive week one without the you know hundred thousand dollars worth of college debt at the, at the end of your four years. You've actually been making money during the whole time and it's uh so I, I think that that's one of the things that should attract our younger generation to doing what they do absolutely i mean you're making money right away you're gaining experience within a, a career and then you get to almost double it once you once you finish absolutely and that that's the beauty of it. i mean honestly if you're let's just say you're you're that 25 dollar an hour journeyman last i checked i mean that that's a thousand bucks a week that's fifty two thousand dollars a year after after a four years uh, and you've been earning money the whole time, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good clip for a 22 year old guy or gal. Last, last I check, that's really good. Yeah, absolutely. And for you yourself, Donnie, I, I think I know the answer, but I want to sort of hear your thought process. So you went through training yourself. Can you walk us through kind of what training program you did? Um, believe it or not, when, when I came up to the trades, I went through uh, four years of the School of Hard Knocks. Believe it or, believe it or not, I did. Um, was that what you were expecting? No, but that's okay. I did an apprenticeship, but it wasn't a formal school training apprenticeship. They just really weren't that prevalent in my, in my area and at the time where I came up through the trades. So I had to just focus more and I had to really honestly learn on my own. Back then, I mean, we didn't have internet wasn't really prevalent. It was just really getting started. So I read a lot of books, a lot of technical manuals. I focused and paid attention to the journeymen um, and lead men that were teaching me. And I just, I, I, I hunkered down and I learned. I, I kind of did it the hard way. But now I'm fortunate enough to be able to instruct via a, a, a true apprenticeship program, a certified apprenticeship program. So it's I'm actually able to, to pass on to the students that book learning that I didn't really get other than learning it out on my own. And I, I do want to talk about that. But for the four years that you invested, and I'm sure all the time you invested outside of work learning your trade, would you say that that investment of your time was worth it? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Again, I mean, here I'm, let's see, I'll be 73, so I'll be 47 this year. Uh, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. It, it's been a great, it's been a great time. Yeah, some days better than other days. Don't get me wrong. You know, nothing's pure utopia, 
but it, it, it really was good. I can't, uh, I, I can't imagine picking a better trade. Sure. And would you ever say that there are scenarios where you think students maybe shouldn't make the investment and join an apprenticeship program? The only, boy, that, that's, that's a hard one because I believe everybody deserves a shot and everybody is fully capable. I mean, face it, we're not building rockets. We're not building pianos. It's, we're not building spaceships. It's, it's just we're building buildings. Anybody is fully capable, man, woman, race, creed. I, I don't care. You're all, we're all fully capable of doing it. If sure. The only exception I would have to that is if you're not willing to give it your all. If you're not willing to give it 100% and be a team player, maybe the construction trades isn't for you. Got it. Good to know. And throughout your early days, did you ever think about joining the union ever? Did that thought ever cross your mind? Uh, it, it did. It has, um, it has a, a couple of times. One, because my granddad was in the union. Both my granddads were in the union. My father was in the union. It never really appealed to me personally. And a couple of times where I actually did look in a little more sincerely into it, it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. So it's just, it just wasn't for me. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I mean, they've got families to feed, same as I do. Yeah. It's just, it's just not my cup of tea. Got it. And what would you say to parents who, you know, have students that are going through maybe middle school, high school, got to start thinking about what they're going to do next? What would you say to parents who have reservations about their daughter or son going into the trades or specifically the electrical trade? I know there's some concerns from some parents that they can think it's dangerous. What would be your response to that? Oh, well, any, anything can be dangerous. I mean, I could walk across the street and not pay attention to get nailed by a bus. Sure. Uh, the, the, you know, the, these things do happen. So in this day and age, we, we've, taken, we, we've taken as many steps as we can to, to mitigate the, the electrical dangers, more so than when I was coming up in the trade. We'll do everything we can nowadays to make sure that the circuit is de-energized before we work on it. And if we do happen to have to work on it while it's energized, there is a, a pretty severe protocol that's got to be followed. Um, so, so we'll take every every step that we can to, to make sure it's off uh, and, and protect our workers. We want our workers to come home the same way that they came into work, healthy, in one piece, happy, doing okay. We want them to go home the same way. So. For parents, you know, uh, give it a shot. It would be what I say. You know, uh, do stuff with your with your kids side by side. You can do little carpentry projects and and do things together and kind of get the feet wet a little bit. Check it out. See if they're really kind of mechanically inclined or not. Yeah, uh, and give it a rip and try. What's the worst that's going to happen? You decide that you're not. It's not for you and you're not good at it. Okay, maybe we go a different route. I like that. And kind of on the the flip side of that, let's say that you're talking to a student who has decided to go into the trade and maybe that student is getting some pushback from maybe their peers or parents, you know, is that really what you want to do? Why would you do that? Why don't you just go to college? What advice would you give to that student? Uh, again, I would tell them just to, just to do it. You know, there's, again, we, we need doctors, we need lawyers, but we also need people to build things. And like we kind of touched on earlier, last I checked, you know, 22 year old person making better than 50 grand a year. It's not such a bad deal. I mean, you can't financially, you, it, it's, it's hard to beat those numbers. Yep. Um, you, th that's great. If, if anthropology uh, or archeology span is, is your thing and your passion and you, you dig it, man, that, that, that's great. Cause I mean, I, I do, I, I, I'm a nerd. Okay. You know, I dig things like that. That's, but the openings for archeologists, uh, there isn't that many for as many kids are going to school and studying archaeology, you know, so the chances of you actually getting a job in archaeology after studying it and then making enough money to pay your student debt as well as support yourself, chances are not good. Your chances are much better entering the blue collar workforce and, and, and being able to do it that way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that the trades are a really good option for some students to consider because I do believe every student is different and has different strengths and weaknesses, but I think far too many students are kind of going down one set path 
when they really should be looking at alternatives that are going to set themselves up really, really well. I know a few people that have done so, and they're loving life right now. They love what they do every day. They're making good money, and you know they're doing the things that they want to do. So it's really something for, for students to look at. Okay, so I noticed, Sonny, that you are a master electrician. I am. So what inclined you to do that, decide to become a master electrician? For me, it was, it honestly was just the natural progression. It, it, it was more of, I don't know if I want to use the word pride, but it was just more of, you know, okay, I was an apprentice, you know, and then I started, you know, leading crews. Okay. Then I was a journeyman and it just seemed a foreman, then to see the natural progression up. And, and I just wanted to, to, to just to do it. Uh, uh, you know, it just seemed just the, the thing to, to go for. And, and I'm glad I did, you know, I mean, it was, a uh, it was a brutal test. I mean, brutal. Ooh, I don't want to take that one again. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've taken on some exams in my career and that one was by far the worst. That was, that was tough a five hour long exam, you know, and, and one of those where I wish I had seven hours. I mean, it was, it was tough. So for students who don't know, can you tell us kind of what the process is to become a master electrician and what do you think that then gives you in the marketplace? Uh, again, it, it's going to, a lot of the questions uh, are going to go back to venue, but here in the state of Texas, you know, you start off as an apprentice. You get 8,000 hours of verifiable experience and, and you can at that time qualify to take your journeyman's test. And once you pass said journeyman's test, you hold on to that license for an additional two years or an additional 4,000 hours. And then you qualify to be able to take your master's exam. And once you do that, that master's exam is the basis for owning your own company, uh, running someone else's company that has a master's license. It's the start to a a contractor's license. Like if you want to own your own business, you have in the state of Texas, you have to have uh, an electrical master either employed or be the, the owner of the electrical company to be able to perform electrical work. So it's really the starting off place, uh, the starting off place for that. Got it. So now I want to jump back to your experience as an instructor. Sure. How, how did you get involved in teaching? And I know you talked about this a little bit, but why, why did you want to get involved in teaching? My teaching career started when I was working for a, one of the larger electrical contractors here in the United States. Um, we had a neat, they had a, a really good foreman training program an in-house foreman training program. And I, I can't remember exactly how I got started into that. I think I was just asked if I could step in and help teach a couple of classes. And then starting starting into that, I thought, wow, this is actually really cool to be able to to talk to at that point my peers, my uh, other foremen, um, and be able to pass along knowledge to them. And then I just literally happened to stumble on my current current place where I teach for. They needed an instructor to start teaching uh, an area of the apprenticeship program, and I thought, well, since I like in, in teaching so much foreman, maybe this won't be so different. And then once I got there, oh, it was, it's just being able to give back is just, a, it, it's the coolest thing. It really is. I do. And what do you like most about being an instructor? I think the, the best thing is when somebody gets something, someone who is maybe struggling with comprehending a, a particular, whether it be a particular equation or a particular process, and they're struggling, they're struggling, they're struggling, and then they finally get it and you see the light come on in their head and they get it because i'm not I, i'm the type of instructor that yeah i the classes the classes that i teach run from five to nine and if a student wants to stay after it till 10 11 o'clock fine i will gladly sit there unpaid and, and we'll sit there and have a conversation until you get it that's my job i, I don't mind doing it and just to see the light come on in their head when, oh, I get it now. Okay, now we've made progress. So it's that that's just rewarding in itself. And do you work with first year, second year, third year, fourth years? Uh, I have taught uh, first, second, and third year. I'm currently instruct our first year accelerator program here in Waco. So also challenging in itself. It's uh, multiple nights a week instead of one night a week. Not challenging just, just for me, but also for our students as well. It kind of puts them, uh, 
puts a crunch on them, but it's but it, but it's good. I think it'll make them stronger for it in the long run. Yeah, and can you walk us through kind of what curriculum is covered or what topics are covered in the classroom training? Absolutely. On the, the first year apprenticeship, we teach a lot of theory because that, that's the stuff that you can't get out in the field. So the, the, hence the reason for an apprenticeship program. I mean, we can, if you want to work out strictly out in the field, which is fine, you'll be a great installer, a great mechanic of learning how to install a piece of conduit or pull a piece of wire. But to have, to be really a true valued electrician, you need the backstory and the theory on why. So we give we give a lot of a lot of stuff on theory. We talk about a lot about Ohm's law, uh, Kirchhoff's law, basic introduction to tools, parts. You get into the the second year, we start really digging into building on that foundation, building up on the foundation of theory, Ohm's law, you build up onto what happens when you do put things in series or parallel circuits and how that applies to transformers and motors. So how we actually get that power delivered to us. Uh, by the time you get into third year, we start digging into the NEC code, which is the, the code that drives what we do. Building on the foundation that they started in first year a little bit more, we start to learn on motor control. So now we're at series and parallel circuits and how it relates to starting and stopping motors and making certain things come on. And then by the time they get into fourth year, uh, we're really into advanced motor controls. Uh, so motor starters and automation of said motors. And then right before their last semester at the IC where I teach it, we really is geared towards uh, code because presumably those guys are going to be going, as soon as they're done with school, they're going to be going to take their exams. So we really try to, to drive that, that code learning home at the, at the last bit so it's retained. Got it. And so students are spending like full work days, basically Monday through Friday, working on the job. And then there's night classes in this particular yeah. program structure. Yes, ma'am. You you got it. So they're gonna they're gonna get the practical stuff in the field Monday through Friday, where they earn their paycheck. They learn how to bend conduit and pull wire. Then they're gonna come into the class and get their 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 theory instruction and onto the basically the why of what what they're doing out in the field. Got it. And then when they are on the job, are they sort of paired up with a mentor journeyman? who kind of guides them or what is kind of their experience on the job? Um, really depends on the application, but generally, yes, you'll, you'll have a, a journeyman that will be overseeing you. You might be a part of a group of, a, of several apprentices. A journeyman is never far. They're, they're always reasonably, reasonably close. Yep. I mean, not to say that they're not out of sight, but you know, they're, they're always reasonably close and to be found. And the guy that they're going to instruct you on how to do your work, they may show you an example of, of what they expect you to do then they'll probably pull back, let you do a couple by them standing there to make sure that you've got it. Right. And then once you've got it, they'll instruct you on, on what to do further. Then they may go down to the next room and grab a, a different apprentice and, and, you know, wash, rinse, and repeat. Got it. And before a student starts that first year, um, what knowledge would you say a student really should have coming into the program before they start? Um, a good work ethic would be nice. Uh, we don't always don't always get that, but yeah. a good work ethic would be would be good. Um, math skills definitely definitely. Uh, I've heard it. I don't know how many times. I, heck, I even said it when I was in school. Boy, I'm never going to use this geometry again. I'm never going to use this algebra again. And then here I am, almost 50 years old, going, "Wow, I'm glad I kind of paid attention because I do use that kind of stuff on a daily basis." Yep, and. Are students, is it okay if they don't have any specific electrical knowledge coming into it? Like they can learn it if they come in with, with basic math and reading comprehension skills? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, again, we're, we're going to teach, we're going to teach them everything they need to know about the trade because uh, not everybody's, I mean, I'd say rarely are you exposed to it unless you have a relative or something that happens to be in the trade. Rarely you're going to be an exposed to it before you get there. And then my next question is, what qualities do you see in the apprentices who are the most successful? What sort of characteristics or skill sets do they display? Um, eagerness uh, is, is probably the biggest one. Eagerness, a willing to learn. Team player uh, is, is probably another, another big one because you're going to be on, um, you could be between small crews or large crews and you really have to be able flexible and be able to work with 
with anybody and adapt to, to something. Because even though we have game plans and we have a plan, sometimes things don't go according to plan and you have to be flexible enough. To, okay, we need to pick plan B or shift gears and go this way because someone else isn't ready for us to be in an area or something happened. So we need to be flexible enough to be able to do something else at, at the drop of a hat. So. And then on the flip side of that, what are the things that you see in students who struggle the most? Um, I'll, I'll probably say the inverse to all those things I just explained. Folks who aren't, aren't willing to work as a team, not that they get singled out, but if you're not gonna willing to be part of a team, you're not gonna be part of a team. And it's the team win, lose, or draw. You know, you know, some days good days, some days bad days. We fail at what we do, but we, you know, we, we pick up and, and try again tomorrow. So you, ha you have to be a team player. You have to be willing to put in the time. There's, there's, there's no shortcuts. There, there's no shortcuts. You have to put in the time. 8,000 hours, I know it sounds like a lot, but that's if you work 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, presuming you're taking two weeks off a vacation a year, that's four years. You can get it done faster if you work, you know, overtime. You can get it done quicker, but it's it's right about four years. So you got to put in the time. You got to put in the time. You got to put in the work. Yeah. So it sounds like the soft skills and the people skills are just as important as the hard and the technical skills. A absolutely. I'd say even if if not more so, uh, because you know we, we don't always get to do things in the best environments. You may be building stuff outside when it's it's snowing or raining, uh, or in the dead of summer, it, it's blistering hot, it's 100 and something degrees, and you're in close quarters with a bunch of other guys and gals. You've got schedules and stuff to keep, tempers get short. So you have to be you have to be willing, you gotta have some give and take, and you gotta have a little bit of patience and a little, little bit of being able to work together. Sure, sure. And what has been, one of the most favorite projects that you've worked on? Hmm. I think I built a casino convention center in California for one of the, an Indian tribe. It was one of those big Indian gaming casinos. Uh, I built a huge convention center there and that was, that was pretty cool. That was, uh, that was, that was pretty neat. I know I built a prison in West Virginia and that one was pretty large. That was a big one. You've really been all over. I mean, that's California. West oh yeah. Virginia. Oh yeah, yeah. I've seen, I've seen all. Of, I've been to, I've been to all the states, but but I've, I've worked from coast to coast in the middle, so I've been, I've been around a little bit. Yeah, that's great. And when you look back at your entire career, uh, do you think there's anything that you would have done differently looking back? Oh gosh, there's lots. There's lots I would have done differently. Believe me, lot, lots I would have done differently, but I wouldn't do it over little small things and just the way maybe I did some things, but, but I wouldn't change the, the experiences or the people that I met or the projects that I worked on or the things that I've done. Uh, I, I may have focused a little bit more, paid attention a little bit more when I, when I didn't, you know, when I should have. Things like that, but for the most part, I wouldn't change anything. And looking back kind of on your entire career, are there any specific lessons you've learned that have kind of stuck with you? that you now sort of live by from your experience? Yeah, I think the ability to, to want to give back and the want to better people, mm -hmm. just make people better themselves. Just because I had, like I said, I had a lot of good mentors that taught me to be a better me. And I think that that's kind of resonated with me in the, the desire to want to do that to other other guys and gals on the trade. I, I think it's super important and it uh, makes you feel pretty good. You know, when you, when you, when you build someone else up and, and you see them benefit from it. So it's, 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 it's good. It's good all the way around. Yeah, absolutely. And then I always like to ask this as the, the final question, if you could go back to your very first day on the job as an apprentice or as a, a worker employee, what is one piece you would give yourself knowing all that you know now that you would go back and give yourself on that first day? Do not cut those three wires at the same time. Oh, God. <laughs> That's pretty important. <laughs> yes, it was. It was. Lessons were learned. Lessons were learned. Do you want to share that story, or would you rather keep that? Oh, I, it, it's fine. I was I was uh, working in a restaurant, and I was hooking up a light in the bathroom, uh, 
and and again I was they it was in the first or the second day and uh, my journeyman at the time said hey you, you need help no I got it I know exactly you know what you're doing I know exactly what I'm doing I got it I was I was pretty cocky and and you know I went to just cut the wires to make them shorter and I grabbed all three of them and cut them all at once and well it was energized and well it blew up so <laughs> learn the hard way not have to do that yeah I mean sometimes. You do have to learn the hard way, but then you'll always remember that lesson. Indeed, lessons were learned. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Johnny, for joining us and sharing your experience. And I'm just really impressed with your willingness and your ability to give back so much to the electrical trade. That's really great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate being on. Anytime I can help you, just 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 holler. We'll gladly gladly help you out, however I can. Again, I think it's just a huge uh, a huge responsibility to each and every one of us to to do this, to bring up the trade, to bring up other people into the trade. So I'm I'm willing to do whatever whatever it needs to be done on my part to do that. Thank you for listening to Equez Audio. To learn more about becoming an electrician, head over to equez.com. That's E-Q-U-E-Z dot com to schedule your personal career consultation. During your call, you will be able to talk to a professional in the field, learn about the state requirements, and understand the different training options available in your particular area. If you enjoyed listening, be sure to subscribe, and we would love it for you to rate and review us. Keep in mind that our discussion today mentions views and opinions that are personal in nature and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any school, agency, organization, employer, or company and should be used at your own discretion. We wish you the best in your quest for education.